Welcome to the Higher Ed Jobs Podcast, Ask the Expert Edition. I'm Andy Hebel, the Chief Operating Officer and one of the co-founders of Higher Ed Jobs. And I'm Kelly Sherwin, the Director of Editorial Strategy. Today we're here with expert Matt Trainum, who is the Vice President, Networks and Strategic Partnerships at the Council of Independent Colleges. Welcome, Matt. Andy Kelly, good to see you again. Good to be with you again. Good to hear from you again. Nice to see you again, Matt. Today's question for Matt is, could you provide examples of successful cost-cutting and revenue diversification strategies implemented by colleges and how these can help colleges stay resilient in this higher ed landscape? Um, I, I love this question, Kelly. You had said right before we came online, boy, this is a big one. And uh, it is, isn't it? I'd like to just ground us in a reality, which is that most colleges need to turn a profit. And I, I pause there for a minute because I just want to acknowledge it again. Most institutions of higher education need to be able to, at the end of the year, have more money coming in than going out. Historically, that was easy because we had more and more students attending colleges. And even when there was a, a bit of a cap hitting for traditional age students, institutions were able to expand who they serve. But this, this idea of turning a profit is a necessary item. And the challenge of this moment of making a profit is a challenge that many, many schools are in. This is a hard space, and it is outside the failings of any particular administration, any particular admissions team, and any particular president. So I just wanted to set that landscape a little bit of saying this is a issue for the sector that the sector is dealing with. Um, I also like to say that, as I mentioned a minute ago, that Schools have been dealing with this in many ways for decades. How do we expand and find more students? If you go back in time, 15, 20 years, the percentage of student athletes on many campuses was not near what it is now. The percentage of student athletes on many private, independent, smaller colleges is 60, 70, even 80 percent of students. And that's because that is a strategy. Back to this question, what is a strategy? That is a strategy for recruitment. Expansion into adult learning populations is a strategy for recruitment to be able to have enough students to cover the expense of operating the institution. I will round all of that up and say that this is a question about who we serve, who are we serving, and the idea of what are the list of diversification strategies. I mean, certainly some institutions can sell land and can do some other things, but most of the time, this is a question about who our audience is and how we serve them. So the answer is. We have to serve our audience with more options, or we have to expand our audience. And that takes us into this question of all the different possible audiences that we have out there. And that's where we can find success in terms of diversification for institutions right now. Matt is always so good about pausing for our thoughts. And now we're looking at each other like, you talk first. You're too good. <laughs> um, I think you've really encapsulated what the challenge is. Just to kind of further evolve the question, I think we have to realize what we're working with here. First of all, and let's acknowledge it, part of what we're working with here is we don't agree on a lot as Americans right now, but people all agree that college is too expensive. Right. That's part of what we're fighting. And we're fighting the idea of, is it worth it spending this money? It's not the same, as you like to say, Matt, it's not the same institution on the hill. Maybe we should be in the cave at this point. That's the first thing. Second thing that is absolutely true is what we've been asked to do over the past 30 years at colleges and universities is to provide more and more and more to students. A college experience today is a wonderful experience. It's not an experience everybody can afford still, but it's a wonderful experience. So it's not inexpensive to do it. The infrastructure and running the infrastructure of a college or university is a tremendous expense. It's not just a cheap endeavor. But then on the other side, we have this weird part. As part of the recruitment process, you've seen college sticker prices go through the roof. You hear the stories, I'm not going to pay a half million dollars to send my kid to school. Whereas I think if you really look at the reality, and let's separate it, there are a handful of institutions that are super expensive, super elite, super competitive. And if you're going to send your kids there, you're going to spend a lot of money. But that is not the other nearly five or 6,000 colleges or universities. And the structure though is let's keep those 
retail prices super high, but the school that you go to that then provides 97% of students get some sort of tuition scholarship or remission or some sort of financial aid package that lowers the base sticker price even before loans. I think before you even do anything about cost cutting and explaining it, this is an investment. Whether you're buying a house or buying a car, there's a truth on lending disclosure the federal government makes you do. It would be wonderful. I'm not suggesting anybody actually fully understands truth on lending disclosures, but I think financial transparency on the behalf of the institution as you recruit and an honesty of what the investment might be for the standard student and saying, here's the sticker price, but here's the reality of the situation. And our average student comes in with that and saying, we want to be transparent. And to boot, this is what it costs us to run the institution. I think that would reset the conversation and have a place to start off that you're going to be honest about it. I also think that transparency with faculty and staff will make it easier to understand when you have to make those diversification strategies and cost-cutting measures to make the numbers work out. Because that is a real thing that colleges and universities are feeling today. I always love how Andy is bullish on education as a market and on good principles and how they can work out well. Uh, Andy, I, I love that. I will add on to that, that when you're looking at diversification, we're, we're taking a different approach to the answer to this question, right? And so another different approach to the answer of what else can institutions do? Institutions can succeed with the students that they have. Retention rates at institutions are miserable at most institutions outside the top maybe 50, 60, 70 institutions in the country. And so first thing I would do at an institution, if someone said, I want to diversify my, my revenue streams, what you do, I would say, well, let's keep more students. Who are the students that are coming that are not staying? That is ready revenue for the institution. And it, my gosh, it's a win for the families and the students there. I'm really not trying to be um, flippant with that comment. That is the first revenue. It is positioned for you. It is a four-year pipeline of revenue. The students who have showed up at your door asking for you to serve them. And so I would focus on how to serve them. So back to that question of who are we serving, there are students who have already picked you, serve them better, and that lifts everyone's boat. I'm glad you brought that up because I was looking at the second part of the question and I was asking myself, are there ways colleges can stay resilient without cost cutting? And you, you had a perfect example right there, taking care of their current students, retaining those students, retaining the staff and faculty. Retention is obviously key. We've talked about this numerous, numerous times. So thanks, Pat. That was, that was a great addition. Well, maybe I will dive headfirst into cost cutting then. Um, <laughs> Go. I, 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 I very much agree that retaining students and understanding why students stay and in instances why they don't necessarily stay. Right. And trying to best meet what the needs are. If you've put the energy in, there was one point where they saw a path for themselves there, help them figure out how to get back on that path. But on the cost cutting side, I think the part that when I've had this conversation with schools, I'm always kind of amazed that they want to talk about cost cutting, but they don't really know the granular data of what each credit hour costs for each class, for each section. What is this running us? How is this looking? Before you have those conversations, if you don't know on an extremely granular basis about what things actually cost, then I think you're really doing yourself a disservice to have the conversation. I think when you actually know that data up front, I'm not sure it's a cost-cutting measure that's as necessary, but better understanding what's leading to those greater expenses and trying to find out why something might be 75% more expensive in one instance than another and trying to solve what the root problem is. Now, you could say, well, that, that's just a fancy way to talk yourself out of cost-cutting. Is it? I'm not sure. If you don't know what the actual information is, that's the first thing you can do. And I think that's where being transparent in this way to, to your faculty, to your staff, to your students, to the community is, I think, the first step in the whole process. I think schools have a hard time doing that. Andy, in the work I've done across institutions and the experts I've talked with, I've never once heard someone promote, I've never once heard someone promote the idea of, let's say, a 5%, 10% across the board reduction has the best way to cost cut. This goes right to your point, 
which is what does the data say? Where should we actually cut and where should we invest? Um, there are a lot of outside organizations that are helping colleges and universities cut expenses. More and more of them are actually approaching it as how do we help reallocate expenses so that we can find the areas of growth and the areas of possibility for you. I will highlight a very, very, very prominent area of cost cutting right now, and that is program review. And that is usually the next step, Andy, after all of that data, right? We have all of this data. We see our costs. We see how much it costs to educate a student in this kind of program versus that kind of program. And now we're going to align our programs. And this, uh, this program realignment and program review is huge. It is huge in really all of our institutions across the sector. I want to take a second and say that program review is not a failure of teaching. It's not a failure of the people that are in those programs. It is an acknowledgement and a reflection of a changing marketplace. And I think that the when program review shows up on campuses, it is often felt like as a failure. And what it really is, is an evolution of the people we're serving back to that question of who are we serving. And so that's a that is a very popular approach. And I think we've talked a little bit already here about how to do it transparently with good data and with growth in mind. Well, thank you, Matt, for all your insights today. This was a great conversation. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate being here as always. And thank you for listening. If you have a question or comment or thought, please feel free to email us at podcast at higheredjobs.com or tweet us at higheredjobs. We look forward to talking with you next time.